Podcast Nuggets. I think the most important skill anyone can develop is time management skills, how you use your day. But there is one principle I want to stress because this is very important to me. And when people ask me for advice, and once again, this cuts across all fields, but this is the advice I give. In your life, you will be evaluated on your output. Your boss will evaluate you on your output. If you're a writer like me, the audience will evaluate you on your output. But your input is just as important. If you don't have good input, you cannot maintain good output. And the problem is no one manages your input. The boss never cares about your input. The boss doesn't care about what books you read. Your boss doesn't ask you what newspapers you read. The boss doesn't ask you what movies you saw or what TV shows or what ideas you consumed. But I know for a fact I could not do what I do if I was not zealous in managing high-quality inputs into my mind every day of my life. That's why I spend maybe two hours a day writing. I'm a writer. I spend two hours a day writing. But I spend three to four hours a day reading and two to three hours a day listening to music. People think that that's creating a problem in my schedule. But in fact, I say, no, no. This is the reason why I'm able to do this. Because I have constant good quality input, that is the only reason why I can maintain the output. In recent years, I've found that most of the ideas in my head are recycled opinions from whatever podcast I've heard recently. I spend a great deal of time consuming ideas, but almost no time producing or pursuing my own conjectures. Can you elaborate on your process for thinking through a topic, wrapping your head around an idea, and arriving at your own opinion? I uh, commend you in noticing this distinction. There definitely is a distinction between just consuming other people's ideas and thinking things through on your own. Now, they're related. The latter is certainly facilitated by reading good books and listening to good conversations. You need to take in the information in in order to form an opinion about it. But there is an added step in arriving at your own views, and it's not often entirely passive. There's something about writing that forces that to happen. I forget who it was. Was it Francis Bacon? Some great early intellectual said that I write to discover what I think. I think it was Bacon. And that is a fairly accurate description of what it's like to write about ideas. You often find yourself discovering what you think in the process of writing. Writing is really a technology for thinking more carefully. And to some degree, speaking in public is as well. I mean, this is, you know, to speak the way I am now on a podcast is almost like the roughest draft of writing something. But it it does take a little extra work than just listening to or reading what other people think. But that said, it's also not a bad thing to have in your head the well-considered opinions of informed people. I mean, that's most of anyone's knowledge on a given topic. Most of what we think is not a matter of us thinking through the problems for ourselves based on some raw data. We're dealing with the executive summaries on almost every topic. And that's just what it's like to be living a single human life where you can't do everything. But where you care, you know, it's worth making extra effort and figuring out what really makes sense to you. A question about workflow here, and then there was some further questions about whether it involves meditation or taking a walk, and what role does reading the work of others play in my process? Yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time reading, obviously, and I read a lot for this podcast. I'm often reading the book of the person who's coming on the podcast next, and I often make the decision of who to invite on the podcast on the basis of just which book I want to read next. So, For instance, this week I've got Michael Pollan coming on the podcast. He's just written this big book on psychedelics and the new research that's coming on that topic. And I knew I wanted to read the book, so why not have him on the podcast? That's how I, in many cases, can justify 
reading a book like that. Yeah, my process, there's nothing esoteric about my process. Meditation is not a way that I consciously try to form new ideas or refine what I think about things, but it is a very common experience that while meditating, very clear thoughts about various topics I've been thinking about or new ideas spring to mind, and that can be useful and it can also be distracting. You kind of have a compost heap. And if any of you are not gardeners, kitchen people, um, the compost heap is where you throw all of the garden and the kitchen rubbish, the food scraps, you throw it all on the compost heap, and then it rots down. And a year or so later, you look around and you just have this lovely brown stuff that you can put on the garden, out of which flowers and vegetables will grow. And I think it's really important for a writer to have a compost heap. Everything you read, things that you write, things that you listen to, people you encounter, they can all go on the compost heap and they will rot down and out of them grow beautiful stories. I think the thing that you don't understand, especially as a young writer, when people talk about your influences, is the tendency is simply to go and look at the things like the thing that you do and point to them. So it's easier for me probably to point to Tolkien and Dunsany and James Branch Cabell, to Ursula Le Guin or, or P.L. Travers and say, well, I do stuff like this and I can point to those people. And what you don't necessarily point to is the stuff that does what you do but is in a different kind of field or a different kind of area entirely. My wife writes songs. She makes music. She performs. And what's important to her is emotional honesty, is truth. And she was probably in her late 30s before she realized that in all of the lists of influences that she would give when people would say, well, what are your influences? And she'd talk about The Cure or Leonard Cohen. She'd talk about punk bands. She'd talk about all of these things that she loved. She'd never talk about Judy Bloom because Judy Bloom was an author who she read when she was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and an author who changed her and went in really deep and talked about honesty and gave Amanda the things that she wanted. For me, I never talk about Lou Reed. Lou was huge for me. And one of the reasons he was huge for me is he would write these songs that were like three-minute novels. There was a story in there, even if you weren't quite sure what it was, and it was compressed, and it was very, very heightened, because anything that happens with music is always incredibly heightened. And the choice of words in a song is so important, because you don't have very many. So watching how Lou wouldn't tell you what to feel, wouldn't tell you how he felt, that the emotion would actually be almost pulled out of the song, but it will be there for you to interpret yourself, it was probably huge. It's something that I still love doing when I write, is I would much rather not tell you how to feel about something. I would rather you just felt it. I will tell you what happens. And if I leave you crying because I just killed a unicorn, I'm not going to tell you how sad the death of the unicorn was. I'm going to kill that unicorn and I'm going to break your heart. That was something I think I learned from Lou. So your influences are not necessarily the things that you think they are. And your influences, you person watching this who I'm teaching, I'm instructing, you're listening to me, remember that. Remember that your influences are all sorts of things. And some of them 
are going to take you by surprise. But the most important thing that you can do is open yourself to everything. One of your most popular, if not the most popular post of yours in 2019 on your blog uh, was how I practice at what I do. I believe that's the name of the, of the blog post. Please correct me if yes, I'm wrong. That's correct. Uh, and to quote that blog post, you wrote, recently one of my favorite questions to bug people with has been, what is it that you do to train that is comparable to a pianist practicing scales? If you don't know the answer to that one, maybe you're doing something wrong or not doing enough. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, say you're a social scientist or you're a writer or you give public talks. You are out there in some way all of the time. But if you look at people like, say, what Kobe Bryant did or what Martina Navratilova did, they practiced to an extreme degree, and that's how they got better. Martina was not world number one player until she had an intense regime of proper practice. Kobe, the older he got, he realized he needed to practice more, whereas a lot of top stars actually practice less, and they coast on reputation, and they have a guaranteed contract. So just every day, you want to be reading, you want to be talking, you want to be thinking, you want to be exercising, and do it you know, at an intense a level as you can, and just try to do that all day long, and that's practice. And you know, one hopes it will make you better. It's not for you to say, but, you know, that's the hope. How do you practice your scales? What does, what does scales look like for you? Writing out large quantities of material, much of which I never use or publish, writing out different points of view, which are not my own, is also a way of practicing. Trying to talk to a very diverse set of people, in my case, not just academics, uh, not just people I went to high school with, say, uh, listening to highly complex music, I think, is a way to keep your mind active. Uh, periodically reading serious fiction, I think, is something people stop doing after they hit a certain age, maybe 30 or 40. But it forces you to be open to the complexities of how humans actually are. I recommend that, too. I think a lot of what happiness is is a management issue and decisions that you're making right now, like you could be in a shit state of mind right now, but you can make some decisions to adjust that and over the next couple hours, you'll get to a much better place. And these constant management decisions, they waver in and out of your life on a daily basis. Like this idea that you could have a good mindset and then all of a sudden you'll be happy, that's horseshit. Like it's, that's like, it's like the tide. It comes in and it comes out. There's going to be days where you're just not feeling so good physically, and that's going to affect the way your happiness level is. It's never static. It's never the, exactly the same. This is something I've cultivated for a long time and avoided things that make me unhappy and figured out what those things are and been very rigid about eliminating them from, from my life. And one of the big ones is eliminating interactions with people that are negative. That is gigantic. And be, because I've realized that I'm not really as independent as I used to like to think I was, I used to like to think that my thought process was independent and that I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. That's nonsense. People say that because they absolutely care what people think and it bothers them. So they say, I don't give a fuck. But that I don't give a fuck stuff is almost entirely nonsense. You do care. And you care in both ways. You care if people are critical of you, care if people are positive of you, but you also care if people are living positive lives and they're motivating you. That's, that's a big one. People are fuel and other people, it's one of the reasons why I like talking to people. One of the reasons why I like to do podcasts because I get a lot out of, you know, like just talking to you about your time in the monastery or your, your push to get to that hundred miles. Like you get energy out of people like that and you think about this energy and you think about this inspiration when you're doing other things and it also sets in your mind that when you meet these exceptional people that move you like what are the characters what are the qualities that they have what are the characteristics that they that they possess and those things become significant and important to you Whereas if you live around a bunch of people that are complaining and bitching about everything and they see the negative in everything and they're always whining, 
those people are the opposite of that. They're the opposite of inspiration, and they're, they're just they're they're mud. You're just like Bleh. it's like you're up to your ankles in mud. You try to trudge through life. It's difficult. You're not light. It's not it's not pushing you. There's not a wind at your back. The wind's in your face, and it's rough. You know, and over time, I've learned that these people, you just, you, you're not going to fix them. I used to want to fix them when I was young. I used to want to go, hey, man, I see what you're doing. Like, dude, don't do that anymore. Listen, just try, just just do this and, and stop doing that and start doing this. And if you just work towards this, you could be successful. And then a week later, the guy's doing the same shit. You're like, okay, right. I'm wasting a significant amount of my energy on someone who doesn't want to waste any of their energy on themselves. And so managing the the community and the tribe that you're in, making sure that you're a good member of that tribe, that you're doing your part, you know, and there's a lot of uh, cynicism in these days about uh, inspiration and about motivation because there's a lot of fake shit. You know, you can go on Instagram and you see a million of these inspirational quote pages and they're run by people that are probably depressed you know you see a lot of people that are you know talking about how to get ahead in life but they're not really doing anything themselves so there's a lot of cynicism involved in that but there's also sincerity in it and you can get if you just look at it with a pure heart and a pure mind you can get a lot of energy out of that and when you're around happy inspirational people that are successful it makes you feel better and you get inspired and if you act on that inspiration your life will be more fulfilled and it's not just inspirational in terms of financial success but in terms of doing difficult things whether it's running a hundred miles it doesn't pay you a goddamn thing other than the, the 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 wealth of the knowledge that you can push yourself to such an extreme or anything else, whether it's someone who becomes really good at playing chess or someone who's really good at martial arts or, or whatever it is. There's, there's a great feeling in these overcoming these difficult things because life is never this just constant state of, I'm at a nine all day, and when I'm with right. my wife, I hit ten. Yay, and I stay like that. That's not real. What's real is like... You saying that you went to this monastery and felt all this this angst about meditating and being alone and not having your phone and not having the input, but then when it comes out of it, then you have this reward. So you you push through this and you had these uncomfortable feelings and you came out of those uncomfortable feelings with this newfound appreciation for time and this newfound this respect for your own existence in your own space and carving out three hours for yourself a day. That's where it all comes from. It all comes from life lessons and the Lessons are learned through struggle. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that think somehow or another you're going to get to some place where you're living in silk sheets and you're getting your toes done while someone's dropping grapes into your mouth. I don't want that. I've never wanted that. You, that guy's not going to be happy. He's going to be bored. An hour into the grapes, you're going to get those fucking grapes away from me. Stop painting my toes. What am I doing in this bed? I got to do something. I'm not stimulated. The human organism, the animal that we are, needs constant stimulation because it evolved trying to find food and escape enemies and find shelter, escape nature, escape the elements, try to survive. And this is the great joy that you have in taking care of your children, that you can protect your children from the elements and the enemies and feed them. And, and it's also the great sadness that you see in losers. When I see a loser, I see some guy who's 43 years old, lives in his parents' basement, and he fucking hates the world. I'm like, that was a baby. Man, this is a baby that somebody just gave shitty nutrients to, whether it's f nutrients in the forms of food or in the form of thoughts and ideas and examples. And this kid developed these horrible, self-defeating patterns of behavior that have led them to this point where they're this, this middle-aged person with no future and no idea of how to get out of this rut and probably never will escape it and might just wind up sucking on a gun. You know, I mean, this is this is the world that we live in today. And I think part of that world is because we have been fed this line of horseshit that you're supposed to seek comfort. And I don't think you are. 
I think you're supposed to seek lessons and you're supposed to seek difficult tasks and, 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 and accomplishments and through those things and through doing things that are hard to do, even if it's just a fucking 90 minute hot yoga class. I do a 90 minute yoga class, man. I, those last 20 minutes, I do not want to be there, man. And I definitely don't want to give 100%. And I can cheat. I can I could kind of half-ass it. I can, I can, but if I don't and I get through it, when that time is up and the lady says namaste and everybody gets up, I'm like, fuck, man, I made it. You know, I lost 15 pounds. My fucking yoga mat is drenched to the point where I could literally wring it out and fill a, a, a jug up with water. But through that struggle, I will now have a better day. And I better fucking do it again tomorrow or do something else. Because if I just think, well, tomorrow I'm just going to coast and eat Twinkies and watch TV. Oh, hello, sadness, my old friend. Hello, depression. Because when you're not doing anything, you feel like shit. And that's just a part of being a human being. And we can pretend that we're something other than what we really are. And we can pretend, nah, me, man, I'm just cool, just chilling, doing nothing. Bullshit. You're a fucking human. You're a human being. You, you evolved from the fucking hundreds of thousands of years of hunters and gatherers and people that were struggling. Those re human reward systems are carved deeply into your DNA. And if you don't respect that, if you don't respect the mechanism of happiness and fulfillment and what you really need to do in order to feel satisfied in life, camaraderie, love, family, friendship, struggle, testing yourself, learning, all those things are imperative. They're all a giant part of being a person.